Today we're going to cover the core of this video series and the last one that is presentation and application layer. The protocol data unit for this two layers is the same that is just data. Uh, for presentation layer, the protocols that are being used are ASCII, MPEG, SSL, TLS and compression. Now let's define what happens at presentation layer. So basically the presentation layer specifies the encoding, encryption, and compression methods for proper communication. Anything sent from the application layer is received by presentation layer, which is transformed into a suitable for transmission via the session layer. So what it wants to say is what you receive from layer seven here is processed in layer six, which is then transformed for transmission so that it can be passed on to your session layer or layer 5. Beginning with two most common type of attacks in presentation layer which have been carried out are number one phishing attack and second one is SSL hijacking. Let's try to understand phishing attack by the way definition. Phishing is a cyber crime in which the target or targets are contacted by email, telephone, or text message by someone posing as a legitimate institution to lure individuals into providing sensitive data, such as your personally identifiable information, banking, credit card details, and passwords. Now, let's have a look at a suspicious or a sample phishing email and what are the things or questions you should be asking before opening any attachments on a phishing email. First, look at the form address and ask yourself these questions. Uh, I don't recognize the sender's email address as somebody I ordinarily communicate with. Is this email was sent from someone inside the organization or customer or vendor or a partner that is very unusual or out of character? Or you can ask yourself, is the sender's email address from a suspicious domain like a pay or Microsoft tech support? Subject. Did I get an email with a subject line that is irrelevant or does not match the message content? Is the email message a reply to something I've never even sent or requested? Next is date. Did I receive an email that I normally would get regular or during regular business hours? Say for example, in this case, well, it was sent at a very unusual time, like 3 a.m. in the morning. Who would do that? Two, was I CC'd or carbon copied to an email sent to one or more people, like a distribution list, but I don't personally know the other person it was sent to? Did I receive an email that was sent also sent to an unusual mix of people. For instance, it might be a random group of people of my organization whose last name starts with the same letter or a whole list of unrelated addresses. Look at the content and ask yourself this. Is the sender asking me to click on a hyperlink or to avoid a negative consequence or to gain something of a value? Or is the email out of ordinary or does it have any bad grammatical or any spelling errors? You should really look for those, you know, easy to recognize. Attachments. The sender included an email attachment that I was not expecting or that makes no sense in relation to the message. Or you can ask this, or you can look for this. I see an attachment with a possibly dangerous file type. The only file type that is always safe to click on it is a .txt file. Last one, be very wary of this, that is hyperlinks. When you hover your mouse over the hyperlink that's displayed in the email message, but the link to an address is a completely different website, this is a big red flag. Did you receive an email that only has hyperlinks and no further information and rest of the email is completely blank? Or you can also look for if I feel received an email with a hyperlink that is, has a misspelling or of a known website. Next attack in presentation layer, SSL hijacking. 
Now, SSL hijacking is a type of attack where the attacker generates fake certificates for domains of HTTPS sites and victim attempts to visit. Hence, instead of the secure connection to the target website, they have a secure connection to a cloned proxy controlled by the attacker. Now, SSL hijacking is also considered a man-in-the-middle attack technique as well. For example, SSL hijacking for XSSL hijacking to be possible, the attacker must first use another type of man-in-the-middle attack to intercept the connection between the user and the target web server. This can be done using different other attack vectors like ARP, IP, or DNS spoofing. When attempting to visit the target website, the victim usually establishes a connection to a server controlled by the attacker. The attacker's server then relays all traffic to the target and then back, allowing the attacker to read and modify information along the way. However, if the victim wants to use HTTPS, when visiting the website, their browser will expect the attacker-controlled site to present with an SSL certificate for the domain under attack. This requires the attacker to generate fake certificate for the target and send it to the victim's browser. Now, for application layers, there are some protocols that are widely used. Some of them are very popular ones, that is HTTP, SMTP, IMAP, SNMP, POP3, and FTP. We shall review any two of those and the attacks that are carried out. The most used ones are DNS reflection attack and slow and slow DDoS attack. Let's study them one by one. So what's happening in DNS reflection attack? I'll take a use case now study here where we have an honest user and a DNS server. Our user will send in a packet, probably a UDP packet over port 53, and wants to know, how do I reach google.com in text? Can you give me or help me with the resolver IP address? It'll, it might also have a source IP, a destination IP, and a random port that was assigned. The DNS server then would reply back with the IP address of the google.com with the destination IP and a destination port and also with a source IP address. So this is how a normal DNS would work at a very high level. However, when a DNS reflection attack is being carried out, there are some changes which are, which are being done here. Now when the attacker sends an initial DNS resolver request to the DNS server, Obviously, it'll have a UDP packet, a website address with a destination IP and destination port. However, in this case, the source IP would be different. In this case, the source IP would be source IP of the user. The DNS server would say, all right, that is fine. I'll go ahead and give you the resolved IP address for google.com. Here's your resolved IP address with the source IP address being honest user's IP address. Now, if this is happening for just a few packets, this is absolutely fine. It does not do any harm. But in this case, the attacker would send in the request to many DNS servers and then have the same IP address, which is of the honest user. And hence, the bad actor will send a lot and numerous amounts of DNS queries to the DNS servers, but since it has a spoofed IP address of the honest user, the honest user will receive a large volume of DNS resolved IP addresses. This would be so demanding and taxing for the honest user's computer or the server that it would eventually crash or would come to a permanent halt. This is a very dangerous type of attack because this will result in a DOS or a denial of service for the honest user's web server. Hope that was clear. Next attack on application layer, low and slow DOS attack. A low and slow attack is a type of DOS or DDoS attack that relies on a small stream of very slow traffic targeting applications on server resources. So unlike 
more traditional brute force attacks, low and slow attacks require very less bandwidth and can be very hard to mitigate as they generate very less traffic and very difficult to distinguish between normal traffic. Let's take an example. Now, a low and slow tar attacks target thread-based web servers with the aim of tying up every thread with slow requests, thereby preventing genuine users from accessing the servers. This is accomplished by transmitting data very slowly, but just enough to prevent the server from timing out. For example, the attacker will send uncompleted or incomplete GET requests and over a period of time, it will keep sending those open requests. The server usually waits a certain period of time before calling it a ten timeout. Eventually, it would run out of resources and keep its memory on hold for all those open connections. And hence, the genuine requests will get denied, eventually causing DOS or denial of service attack. Now with that, we come to the end of this video series, which was a four-part series. Do watch the rest of the three series so that you can get an idea of attacks that have been carried out at each layer. Also, let me know in the comments if you want me to cover any of the attacks also with mitigation techniques so that you can have a full comprehensive knowledge of how an attack is carried out and the steps that can be taken to mitigate those attacks. Also, if you would be so inclined, you may contact me at the email address given below for any cybersecurity and training related consultation. I'll be more than happy to make time for you. All right. With that, I'll end this video series. Hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you on the next one. Bye now.